In the last video, we talked about moments of inertia, and we decided we defined the moment of inertia as the measure of our difficulties to rotate the molecule. It's proportional to the mass of the atoms and the rotating distance. And then we also said that the moment of inertia can be used to classify molecules. This is because it can be resolved along three mutually perpendicular axes A, B, and C. The A axis, A, B, and C, coincide with the center of mass of the molecule A, B, and C. And, this, and the uh, moment of inertia along A is represented IA, that along B is represented IB, and that along C is represented IC. The axis A, B, and C are different from the regular axis X, Y, and Z. This one said the lab reference, the X, Y, Z. As the lab reference, the A, B, and C moves with the molecule. It rotates with the molecule. The X, Y, and Z does not rotate with the molecule. So the classification is based on the fact that this principal moment of inertia, I, A, I, B, and I, C, are not necessarily equal to each other. And the convention is that when they are not equal to each other, the one with the lowest I, A value, the one with the lowest value is the I, A along A axis. The next one is the I, B along the B axis. And then the next one is the I, C. That's the largest one is the I, C along the C axis. So the classification is based on the re their relative values to each other. So when we have two equal and one of them approximately zero linear molecules, so the smallest one or negligible one in this case is usually zero. Is a IA and IB equals IC. Then we have the symmetric molecules or symmetric rotors or symmetric tops. So where two of them are equal and one is different, it is not equal to zero. The different one can be bigger than the two equal ones, or it can be smaller than the two equal ones. Then we have the spherical top molecules, where all principal moments of inertia are equal. And then lastly, the most common, the asymmetric tops. That's where not, they are not equal to each other. In that situation, we will call our convention IA will be less than IB and will be less than IC. So let's move on to the linear molecules. So this is an example, sorry, this is an example of a linear molecule. The methane is an example of a spherical top molecules. So the linear molecules like we just defined, the IA is negligible and IB and IC. Are equal. All molecules, linear molecules, have all their atoms lying on a straight line and they are said to be cylindrically symmetric. So, along the internuclear axis, we have the A axis, B and C are perpendicular to it. So, the IA that longs along this uh, internuclear axis is the one that is zero. So, if we look at it, the rotation along the internuclear axis, all atoms are at a distance zero to it. So, since remember, I is proportional to the rotating distance, and the distance from the atoms to rotating axis is zero, then you have it as zero. Then we have rotation in the plane of the page. This is a, from my uh, note. In the plane of the page, the um, axis is around here, so there's a rotating distance, and then we have another one in and out of the page, as you want to call it, and the rotating distance is for these two are equal, hence IP is equal to IC. The smallest or the easiest linear molecule that we can consider is a diatomic molecule. A diatomic molecule has two atoms joined together by their bond distance, by the bond. So this is an example of a diatomic molecule with mass m 
one attached to the mass m2 regardless of the system it's a diatomic molecule the distance between them is represented by r that's their bond length but if you consider a rotating distance remember we're considering rotation a uh, 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 spinning rotation about an axis within the molecule so if we look at this the rotating distance of m1 is represented as r1 and that of m2 is represented as r2 from the center of mass where the rotating um, axis coincides now we have considered the smallest uh, molecule the atomic molecule and also we have considered it in a rigid rotor approximation so when we say a rigid rotor approximation it means that this rotating distance is constant throughout the rotation it is not changing a rigid rotor is a rotating system in which the rotating distance ri is fixed it's a it's a approximation used to describe an ideal rotating object in quantum magnetics just like we considered ideal gas from and then a real gas similarly okay so so we have considered in the the smallest easiest case a diatomic molecule in a rigid rotor approximation okay for our rigid uh, diatomic molecule the moment of inertia will therefore be the mass of one times its rotating distance squared plus m2 times its rotating distance squared from all level physics and the um, center of mass we know that um, m1 m1 r1 equals m2 r2 and with that we can calculate or we can deduce our moment of inertia and express it as a function of the total distance between them and this is more desirable because this is the bond length of the molecule mu is called the reduced mass so it involves the two masses together it's an effective mass of an ideal rotating system okay From quantum mechanics, recall that we said that each energy level, each uh, molecule, each rotational, each motion, each motion has an uh, energy level. From quantum mechanics, the energy level of a rotating system is given as this Ej equals J bracket J plus 1 multiplied by H squared. H is the Planck's constant divided by 8 pi squared i i is the moment of inertia so the energy energy levels are related to i our j which uh, this is often written as b j into j plus one okay let me talk about the j the j is a rotational quantum number so we talk about energy levels so what characterizes the energy levels each energy level is j it's called it's a conventionally written as j b is a rotational constant so b if we compare these two equations so that means we just take this out h squared h pi squared b for i now b is a rotational constant along the rotating axis b so that's why we have i b i b so if it was C, sorry, I don't have that equation on this slide. We can also choose C, but usually B is a, the convention. So you, in most textbooks that you come across, you use a B. But again, you can also choose C. And if you choose C as a rotational constant, and then you have I C. But this might confuse with the, um, might be confusing with the, um, speed of light symbol okay so back to this so now we have the energy levels as j into j plus one multiplied by the rotational constants this is given in joules we can also write it in wave numbers which is more common 
and that's uh, considering that a uh, uh, wave number is given as e over hc and we can also have it in hertz that's per second and then you have h now if you compare this to equation this is h squared over 8 pi squared ib this is h h again is the Planck's constant and this is h as against h squared over 8 pi squared i b c which is the speed of light so we can easily convert from joules to per centimeter to hertz so let's uh, work a little example in this example we're given rotational constants to be 5.5509 hertz and we're told to calculate this in joules and wave numbers so like in the previous slide we already saw the relationship between joules and it's and it's uh, pretty similar to the relationship between energy itself and frequency and the uh, wave number so in joules it's simply in joules b in joules is b in frequency per second multiplied by the Planck's constant so 5.55509 per second multiplied by the Planck's constant 6.626 times 10 to minus 34 per second cancels out seconds and we have our b in joules and in wave numbers you can e either go from the joules or b over c so if we recall the conversion between um, energy and frequency energy and wave numbers it's uh, similar so using the frequency so this is simply divided by the speed of light and then my a second is somewhere up there so this gives us simply that there's also another example that calculates um, calculates the um, relationship between rotational constants now this is given in wave numbers and from that we have to calculate the bond length of the molecule okay so we know that um, the moment of inertia is related to the bond length of the molecule using this formula the um, um, reduced mass is given as mass of iodine since it's a diatomic molecule so it's pretty straightforward mass of iodine times mass of chlorine over mass of um, iodine plus mass of chlorine and we have to convert it to kilogram if you remember the unit of a i it's kilogram times meter squared so we convert it to kilogram using this uh, relationship one atomic mass unit is 1.6805402 times 10 to minus 27 kilogram it's a standard constant number so once we have that that's our reduced mass that's the effective mass of the rotating system where the system is believed to be rotating as one the, we also know that um, there's a relationship between the rotational constant and i so from this we calculate our i to be equal to 8 pi squared b c so after rearranging and substituting all the values we arrive at i being equal to that so from here we can make r the subject of the formula and once we make r the subject of the formula we have r to be i over mu substituting for i 2.4512 times 10 to minus 45 kilogram meter squared and mu 4.55 times 10 to minus 26 taking the square root of everything we have our r to be that so in the next video we'll talk about what does the spectrum look like